Welcome to Home Care, Doors Open, where we discuss licensing, operations, and scaling your home care business. Whether you're just opening your doors or looking to unlock new doors to growth and success, this podcast is for you. Let's begin. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Lucas Carroll with the Business of Senior Care, and we are uh, have a new fresh podcast today where uh, at Home Care, Doors Open. Uh, we have a special guest, Mr. Dan Durney, who is the Director of Franchise Development for Assisting Hands Home Care. Uh, welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. Look forward to chatting with you today, Lucas. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you taking the time uh, in your in your busy uh, busy schedule to talk a little bit about home care, talk a little bit about the market, um, and a little bit about licensing and just sharing kind of uh, an overall status of, of what's going on. Um, you have an extensive, I was looking at your, your CV on, on LinkedIn, and uh, maybe we'll start there. You have an extensive background in operations and franchising outside of home care, which I think provides an extra perspective on home care specifically. Can you share a little bit about your background and, and kind of franchising and the different, different types of business models that you've worked with? Sure. A lot of them have been service-based. I've been in franchise development for 21 years. Uh, before that, I was in IT for 17 years, so go Boomers. <laughs> Love it. But I've Absolutely. represented a number of uh, franchises in uh, service-based uh, industries, uh, the pet industry. Um, Massage Envy was one of the brands I worked with to help launch uh, initially. Um, but yeah, I love working with franchise development and helping people explore opportunities for them that are coming out of corporate America or um, something that they want to do that's more impactful than just having a day job type of situation. So it's it's great working with uh, people to help them realize dreams and start businesses in in a variety of sectors. Absolutely. And now, which which franchise brands? Because um, you have uh, you, you have, and we'll talk a little about kind of the the outsource model for for your franchising. Do you work specifically or exclusively with assisting hands? Or do you provide services for other franchises? I've done some consulting in the past for some others, but Assisting Hands is the primary uh, client that I work with. Uh huh. Awesome. What is? Tell us a little bit about the network for Assisting Assisting Hands right now. How many How many franchisees um, and and what states and kind of what does it look like in in bringing on uh, potential new franchisees in the future? So currently we add typically about a, um, about a dozen franchisees a year, although this year as of July 1st, we'd already signed a dozen. So it looks like we might be doubling that this year. Um, but we have about, thank you, um, we have about 106 franchisees as of today's date, uh, covering over 200 territories in now 30 states. We just recently signed our 30th state in Nebraska. And we have 24 area representatives around the country that are helping to support uh, franchisees in those particular local markets, which we can talk more about that specifically, but that's kind of where we're at today. And we are proudly, emphasize the word proudly, not owned by private equity, still family held company, so. That's gotta be the exception uh, versus the rule here <laughs> yes, in, the, it is. in the common uh, days. Uh, uh, of late, uh, a lot of private equity has been sweeping, swooping in on uh, home care, senior care, and we are just not interested. Yeah, I, I think because uh, we've seen a number of private equity purchases in the home care space over the past five years, five to seven years, and, and, and some of the huge brands uh, that I think that speaks to, you know, a private equity is interested in a return on an investment. and that speaks hugely i think to the to the home care and the opportunity for for growth and and one of the favorite things that i always say is that the home care is a need business not a want business it's not a ice cream shop where somebody can decide discretionary spending on whether or not to get some ice cream or not um, oftentimes family members are put in situations where you know they, they need home care it's not it's not something that they can choose to have or have not and having a business model set up to support, you know, boomers and, and, and the growing senior population uh, and being at the forefront of the care is, is, a, is a great place to be. Well, statistically, everybody knows um, or often hears that the number 10,000 people a day in the U.S. turns 65. For grins, I put that into a spreadsheet. It's every 8.64 seconds. 
10,000? 10, 10,000 people a day if you, if you divide it by the number of uh, uh, seconds in a, in a day. <laughs> Every 8.64 seconds. There's another one. <laughs> There's <laughs> another one. Absolutely. <laughs> So yeah, it's 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 a uh, it's no pun intended, but it's definitely a booming market. It is absolutely uh, the the um, we don't want to talk about the franchisees or le or prospects that you talk about that you talk with, and maybe that's a good transition because when you're having conversations with people who are interested in getting into the home care market, tell us a little bit about where do they come from, what backgrounds do they have, and what attracts them to to this space. Well, in our system, we basically look for people who have a heart for the business, have some people management skills and some basic business acumen. Interestingly, we do not target um, pharma reps or medical device sales reps. We have a couple that are uh, in our system, but for the most part, they come from high tech, construction, food, manufacturing, insurance, um, large consulting companies. We have several that are from like Deloitte and KPMG and Price Waterhouse, PwC, um, but they. But interestingly, even oh, and we have six nurses and two social workers currently. That's as close as we get to the line to the industry. Um, but for the most part, they all have some connection with a parent or a grandparent or a loved one that they either provided care for directly. In some cases, they experienced uh, the impact that a caregiver has on a loved one's life. Um, most of the time it was a positive experience. Sometimes it was not a good experience and they want to get into this business to do it the right way. That's what I was going to ask is a lot of times you'll see this, this underlying theme of having a personal experience in caring for a loved one or having to bring in a company or research, you know, trying to, trying to navigate the healthcare system in the U S and, and sometimes it's a good experience. Uh, sometimes it's not a good experience and, feeling like I could, you know, I could better serve this area with, with a business of my own for home care. Um, what are, in, in having those conversations for the potential, like for when we're talking to prospects, uh, you know, you're talking about eight seconds, every eight seconds, another boomer, um, uh, another 65 year old, what are the types of things that, that you can share with a prospect about, you know, the, the potential for opportunity for clients and for hiring caregivers and what what the potential growth and success could look like for a franchisee. Well, as a franchise, uh, we, of course, have restrictions on doing earnings projections or earnings claims. Um, but uh, in our disclosure document, I mean, our top franchisee just first first one crossed the $10 million a year in gross revenue. So it's very scalable with over 200 caregivers and that's coming for and that's uh, someone that's been in the system 10 years they just renewed their license of course why why wouldn't you if you're doing that kind of revenue um, but it's a very scalable business um, we are office based and we're owner operator meaning that it's not a semi-absentee or passive kind of situation and then the caregivers are all employees or w-2 licensed bonded insured just philosophically we don't believe in sending a contractor into grandma's home yeah, I think that's an important distinction. You'll see two companies uh, on the face that look alike, meaning that they boast of providing home care. Uh, but when you look at the internal, there are setups where you have 1099 or independent contractor caregivers where you're, you know, it's match.com. You're matching, uh, you're matching a independent contractor caregiver with a senior and then stepping back and uh, putting the liability and responsibility on a senior to manage that process, um, which can be challenging for sure. Um, and that distinction, it's, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to see, like if you're Googling, uh, home care in your specific area and they come up, it's not, it's not immediately apparent that there are nuances like that, that can have pretty significant differences, especially like in pricing. When you're talking about pricing for a home care company who has all W-2 employees that does pays the work comp insurance, pays general liability insurance, takes on all the appropriate taxes and all that, the cost for that business is different, a different cost structure than somebody who does um, a registry type. And um, I think that's 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 probably a question that that probably comes up during the prospecting process on the the costs involved. Um. 
cost usually doesn't come up too much um, because in the senior care space, the bulk of the business still today is private pay because the older generation still holds most of the wealth of this country. But we also support our franchisees to select different vendors, uh, pay or sources uh, such as private, or excuse me, such as uh, long-term care and disability insurance. Some folks have policies like that. Some have VA benefits through the Veterans Association and some have uh, Medicaid uh, qualifications. So we support uh, our franchisees in, in whichever kind of pay or sources that they want to, uh, that they want to pursue. This episode is powered by the Business of Senior Care. The Business of Senior Care helps home care, home health, and hospice companies obtain their state home care license and accreditation through one-on-one -on -one consulting, fully customized policies, and years of expertise. To learn more, visit thebizofseniorcare.com. And now, back to our episode. Yeah, we had touched on it earlier about the area representatives and the different um, team members around the country to help to support franchisees and kind of how that model works, um, which is a pretty unique, unique model. Um, could you expand on that, like explain that a little bit as far as how that setup works to support support the network? Sure. So an area representative sometimes have different names. Uh, some refer to it as an area developer, or regional director or developer. Uh, some call it a master franchise, um, which more typically a master franchise is someone who takes the brand to another country and for all intents and purposes operates as the franchisor in that country. Uh, an area representative is kind of a mini-me version of that, where they might have a territory of between four to six million in population responsible for developing, say, 16 to 25 units within the, those territories or within that market area. But their key responsibility is coaching and mentoring the franchisees. They're, they're operating as a franchisee. Uh, they have the experience of how to run the operation because we're not looking for slick franchise salespeople as area reps. We're looking for coaches and mentors that can help the franchisees. So it's an extra level of support for our franchisees. So we really have three levels of support with assisting hands. You have a, someone that's assigned from the national support team. Uh, they work together with the area representative if, it's in, if they have one in that area. And then our whole network, we call it the FOFO, the family of franchise owners. And uh, the whole network of franchisees as a family help support one another as well. Very good. And uh, one of the things that uh, I have seen, but I haven't got yet to experience, is just the awesome uh, retreats that you guys do. <laughs> yes. We have another acronym for that. It's called FEAR, Franchise Education Adventure Retreat. Fear. Our president and CEO likes uh, acronyms. It comes from PwC, so they love acronyms. So our onboarding process is called the BYOC, the Before You Open Checklist. And But yeah, the, <laughs> if you hear someone say, yeah, I went to fear last year, that's actually a good thing. <laughs> uh, it may not but seem we, may counterintuitive, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. But we just uh, had one in uh, Punta Cana, Dominican Republic, and it was a blast. And it's so amazing to see the franchisees get together. It's like a big family reunion. Uh, they ha they hang out. We have franchisees that vacation together and stuff. It's just it's just a real bonding thing. Uh, and we also have a lot of training and uh, fun activities um, for for our fear conventions. Our next one coming up is in Colorado Springs. So we usually do one domestically and then one like in um, Cancun or this. Like I say, this year was the first one in Dominican Republic. So we'd like to make it fun. Yes, I've heard of these uh, great locations and, and great times, and I'll bet that uh, that drives attendance when you when you go to wonderful places like that and have a oh, fun yeah. time and mix in and education. Some bring, yeah. And some bring their kids and family with them. Uh, we ex fully expect that, especially this Colorado Springs one coming up next year in June. Very nice. That'll be a great location. Um, wh where are paths uh intersect you know between between our company and and um, assisting hands is is when it when it comes to licensure uh in the initial part during the franchise development and uh getting prepared uh, the byoc getting prepared for uh, the the franchise to open um, one of the components depending on the state that you're in one of the components is um, getting a license from the the department of health um, and can you t talk about in your experience, sometimes that, that transitions from, from your role into just the operations team and helping to support them. Um, and so it might be more of the operations, but 
um, how, how have you, how has that impacted you working with, with prospects and then franchisees in terms of a roadblock like licensure? Well, one of the biggest questions that does come up is how am I going to get licensed? Do am I just I have to figure it out myself? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, our support team is very experienced. We've been around 17 years. We've been in all the states that have the most extensive licensure, like Florida and New Jersey and North Carolina, um, for years. Um, and we can help the franchisee because someone's assigned from the national support team that takes them through that BYOC. And one of those checklist items is submitting their application to the state. Well, in some states, it's, that's a very daunting task with uh, sometimes over a couple hundred, 300 pages of policies and procedures that they need to be able to submit in the format that the state outlines and approves. And we work with the franchisee to put all that together. Uh, now, ultimately, the franchisee submits it but we work with him hand hand in hand to put the uh, all the required documentation together for the licensure. And some states take 10 months to a year, like Maryland is a pretty drawn out kind of situation, whereas in some states like Arizona, there's no licensure. Unless you're doing Medicaid, then there's some certification you have to go through, but and that's applicable in some other states as well. But for the most part, in some states, there's no licensure. We've opened in offices in quick as 45 days, and that includes going down to uh, Miami for a week of training before they open. So, it is interesting when you get into the licensure how one state right next to another uh, how it can be so, so different, like Arizona that you mentioned, and there there are a number of states where you could hang your shingle. Yeah, you could hang your shingle tomorrow, and um, and no license required. And then there's other states that uh, are very extensive in their licensing, um, both, you know, both, you know, if you're selling, a, a, if you have a franchise in both states, you're providing similar services, you're providing non-medical home care, it's the same setup, but the, the oversight from, from the health department can be drastically, <laughs> drastically different in the wait drastically. time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and preparing probably uh, that for the preparing franchisees to work in tandem with their training, like when timing out their onboarding and opening exactly. with the licensing can be yep. can be a challenge too. Yep. Our BOC is basically designed to be about a 12 week program, but we adjust it depending on the uh, timing requirements for the state licensure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what do you see for uh, just a little bit broader? I'm just thinking about the home care space. So over, you know, the next three to five years in terms of the uh, franchise involvement, the types of services, uh, even like you're seeing more skilled type care being performed or, or being needed by seniors uh, from home care companies, the players that are coming in with big investment like private equity. What does it look like from your perspective? How does it look different or the same over the next few years? Well, um, I wish I had the beautiful crystal ball to predict exactly. <laughs> but uh, some of the things that I do see is that this is still AI proof. Grandma's not going to accept some robot coming in to help uh, make breakfast or lunch for him. And it's just not going to happen. But the um, the market is that any growing market, you have a lot of competition. And so I don't see that uh, changing. Um, you talked about uh, medical. We we do offer the re the option, but not the requirement. If the franchisee wants to get in and offer skilled services, out of our 106 so far, I think franchisees, um, I think two offer some version of some skilled services. One of them just for veterans in one of the markets. Um, and so some of that variation of licensure, like in some states, just handing medication, you have to have a nurse. Just even if it's just a just handing it to them and in other states you can rem you can just remind them um, so the state licensing and requirements as to what constitutes skilled versus non-skilled um, can vary greatly so just being up on all of that information and then adjusting properly but most of the franchisees that like I say that don't offer skilled is a lot of times because they're networking because this is a referral based kind of business so they're networking with say a skilled hospice that will come in and do the wound care and the 
um, medication, et cetera, but they're not interested in sticking around to do the ADLs, the activities of daily living, you know, bathing, feeding, dressing, et cetera. So the franchisees network with those skilled providers and they exchange leads back and forth. So it's not uncommon that you would, I mean, you wouldn't typically want to go into the same business that you're providing leads to somebody and become a competitor now. So. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I agree. And when you have relationships with skilled home health companies and hospice companies and having having mutual referral relationships can be a huge referral source for the business huge and, yep. and uh, being careful not to step on their toes and them being careful not to step on your toes to have that relationship um, can be can be very prosperous uh, because there's like you're saying, there's agencies that just do skilled home health and they do it very well. But when it comes to her need for companionship or, you know, non-skilled personal care, they need a partner and that partner helps them, helps them to make sure that that senior stays in place where they're at and they don't have another fall and they get the nutrition and hydration that they need. So it's a critical re relationship um, to be able to have those. So uh, that's a good, that's a good perspective. I, I know that for some, you know, in some states, uh, when it comes to like referral sources or payer sources like VA, there's a potential, you know, to, to nab some of those referrals that have a little bit of skill in there, like a nursing service along with the non-medical. And so for some, for some home care owners, it can be attractive to do a little bit of skilled, uh, meaning that some nursing and some aid services to be able to kind of expand their scope a little bit uh, and, and getting the appropriate license and not going like the full blown uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, right, right. Um, and, and, and physician's orders and then billing Medicare and all that, but just expanding their scope so they can get uh, additional referrals. Um, so both, just, both are good perspectives. Also, just to mention, assisting hands in particular, uh, as I mentioned, one of our differentiators is our flexibility. Um, as we don't dictate to our franchisees the cases they take, we have some franchisees who have clients that are like on a short-term rehab, like a post-op recuperation, a hip or a knee replacement, whether they're a senior or not. We have franchisees that have women who are high-risk pregnancies, whether they're on bed rest for a few months before and a little bit after they give birth. Um, some have a special needs like Alzheimer's and dementia, which you would expect, and even autism. And a handful of franchisees work with developmentally disabled adults, which can go from age 18 and up. So a lot of flexibility for our franchisees to determine the cases they take and the payor sources they work with and we can help them with all the interfaces they need for the billing and invoicing between our uh, software scheduling and our quickbooks online ecosystem. that's wonderful and, and probably having the more localized area representatives who know who know more about the state more about the specific community is probably a great resource to be able to have those conversations okay well, sir, I think uh, that that's uh, some great conversation um, but, and questions, and um, I really appreciate your time. I, you know, I can't think of anything else at the moment as, uh, to, to tackle. These are some good topics, and learned a lot about assisting hands and your background, and and uh, I just greatly enjoy you, uh, you and taking the time. I would share one other question as to what I noticed. Uh, I get asked a lot about what makes a home care business successful, and regardless of the brand, I think that if you are doing it full time, because two things don't work in this business. One is trying to do it part time while you keep a full time job. It just doesn't work. And the other is no matter how capable a person thinks they are trying to do everything themselves just doesn't work either. So we look for a starting staff of three, a recruiter, a, um, a scheduler, and then someone doing marketing. So they just have to be very focused on launching launching and running the business and then as they build their staff because it's a hard business at the beginning you know it's 24 by 7 on call kind of business but as you build your staff up with key hires that are responsible could be able to take the after hours calls and the, uh, the phone on the weekends and things like that um, but it's very rewarding type of business and with all due respect to some businesses that are very transactional kind of thing one and done uh, getting the a letter or an email or a card from a client or a family member of a client that says, we just greatly appreciate you sent Susie in and she's just made a world of difference, not only for my dad, but for our whole family. You just can't compare that kind of uh, um, gratification.
to uh, any other kind of business. So that's why I love working with uh, assisting hands home care. Oh man, that, those are just some great points. I think sometimes at the end of the day, when uh, in home care, the opportunity to be inside a senior's home to see who we're taking care of, to have conversations with really, you know, folks of the greatest generation uh, and see the pictures that they have on the wall and the, sh and the stories that they share of just the most amazing things. Um, and, and I found that too in, in, in uh, you know, running a home care business is that sometimes when you're stuck in the office, you forget, you forget that we're not building widgets out there and, and getting them off the assembly line. We're taking care of some pretty amazing people and getting out into the homes signing up clients, doing just saying hello, doing supervisory visits and seeing the actual people that you take care of and just the difference that your caregivers make in the lives of the senior. Um, I agree with you. That's just, that's so different than there's so many of the other businesses out there that there's that extra X factor of doing it for a reason, having a, a mission, having a purpose and just providing care is, is, uh, is a huge, it's very rewarding. I find it very rewarding. It's very rewarding for the type of work that, that home care owners do. Definitely agree with that. So, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you, Dan. And thank you everybody for tuning in on uh, this uh, podcast for Home Care Doors Open and have a great day. If you found this conversation valuable, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Also, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Business of Senior Care. We'll see you next time on Home Care. Doors open.